So yeah, as Matthias said, you may have seen me at these things before. Uh, so I'm not actually going to go into too much detail about what I've done in the past. But uh, I'm based here in New York. I do a lot of different things: uh, designer, director, animator, yada yada yada. List there. Um, I use C4D in a lot of the things that I do, though. So this, that's kind of one of the the building blocks, one of the key components of just a lot of the projects that I take on. Um, and yeah, so with that, I, I think I'll jump right into it because I think we're a little behind schedule and I've got a lot I want to go through. So I'm going to talk about cameras today. And this is, this is really, uh, in, in the past, I've done a lot of talks about uh, professional work I've done. I've taken a final project. I've kind of broken it down into how we made it. This is actually a little bit different. This is more of a personal exploration that I've been doing over the last couple of years. And it all started with uh, this camera you see right here. This is actually my, my parents' camera, Pentax K1000. And I... I inherited it and I, I shot a lot with it growing up as a kid and uh, brought it to college. And if, that, if this starts to sound familiar, it may actually be because uh, I did a very similar talk about a year ago uh, at the, the Maxon Super Meet in Germany. And for those of you who saw that talk, and you can see here it's on YouTube, uh, a nice 247 of you uh, were nice enough to give it a little thumbs up there. Uh, so I'm not actually going to go through in detail everything I covered uh, in this talk, but I am going to do a very quick a uh, quick run through to at least get you up to speed. But if you are interested in seeing that talk and if this kind of like spurs your interest and you want to see it in more detail, uh, I've put a little uh, forwarding URL here so you can go there and actually see that uh, video I just posted. All right, so if you didn't see that before, it will help to get some understanding of what I'm talking about. So I'm going to just very quickly run through what I talked about in that, uh, that presentation just so that we're all on the same page here. So back to the camera. So years and years ago, I think this was maybe like 2012 or so, I was, I was curious about getting better at modeling, like hard surface modeling, like literally making this as a, a CG asset. So I, I figured, well, that's a kind of a cool looking object. I'll just try making it and just started kind of chipping away at it over sort of my free time. As many of you have probably gathered, I'm kind of obsessive about things sometimes. So I'm going into all this detail of kind of looking at the insides and really trying to get that. Of course, what's a camera without a lens? Uh, a lens needs optics. So I actually found a diagram of what the, the, the real optics of this lens were. Uh, did a model of that, uh, got it in there, it's all looking pretty good, you know, more obsessive stuff, getting in there on the inside, uh, getting into UVing, you can actually texture it. Uh, fast forward a few years, I was actually getting into Substance Painter, so I brought it into Substance Painter and started to actually give it a nice looking texture. And again, this is, this is, this is an area that I actually really enjoy, is putting in all these little uh, sort of the, the, the wear and the details and things that make it look like uh, it's, it's a used object that, uh, that exists in the real world. But I kept on coming back to an angle like this, and I was, I was I kept on thinking, well, if I'm getting this obsessive about all these details, what I want to do is I want to put the, the camera in Cinema 4D at this position and be able to see out the lens of the camera, because that's what you do in real life. You stick your eye up to there and you see out the lens. So why can't I do that in CG? Let's, let's see if we can make this happen. Uh, so my initial tests were sort of figuring out, well, what's actually going on inside the camera there? So this is using the, the pentaprism and the mirrors and everything that are actually reflecting the light around inside the camera. So I was figuring out how that all worked. I did a little mock-up in Redshift to figure out, well, can I get that to work? And it actually worked really well, you know? It's kind of what I thought I wanted to do. There's, there's, uh, you're looking out the viewfinder and seeing the, the object. But in reality, I was missing a rather big portion of that, and that's something called the focusing screen, which it's, it's actually a piece of ground glass that goes between the viewfinder and then the mirror and the lens. What it actually means is that you can actually see the depth of field. You can actually see what is actually going to be recorded on the film. You're not just literally sticking the lens up to your eye and looking through it. So this actually gives the image a very different quality than if you were literally just to get rid of that and look through the lens. And this is kind of where the adventure truly began, was figuring out how to get this to work in CG. The renders I was using, I was playing with Redshift, Noctane most of the time, they weren't really able to handle this. They didn't even know what to do with this idea of projecting an image onto a piece of ground glass and then looking through it from the other side. It's like a rear projection, and they just didn't, couldn't figure out what to do. So I ran across this render uh, called Indigo that's actually a very physically accurate render that uh, they really bill it as almost like a light simulator. And you can see just based on the images there, it's geared towards the glass and caustics and reflections and all of these things that I wanted to get. But the first thing I did with it was really try to go back to bare basics. So I was trying to make a pinhole camera. And if you don't know a pinhole camera, it's literally just in your box. You put a tiny little hole in it. And the idea is the back side of that box will actually get a projection of what's outside that box, just through the light being uh, focused through that tiny little hole. Uh, so here's my CG setup of this. So I've got a tiny little hole in a box with a scene on the outside. And if I cut it open and raise the exposure to a ridiculous amount, you can see I'm actually getting a representation of the scene on the outside on that back wall of the, the box on the inside. So th this kind of proved to me, OK, my idea works. The, the, this renderer can handle this idea of uh, projecting an image. Uh, these are some sort of 
really crude renders from early on in that process of trying to figure it out. It's upside down because, of course, the lens flips the image upside down. And the, the sampling is really low at this point. This is once I obviously correct the rotation and get many more samples, get a smaller little pinhole there so it gets more precise. Uh, of course, you need a lens as well. And I realized I didn't really know how lenses work. So I did a bunch of exploration into those and sort of what actually, how a lens actually works, what the geometry of them actually are, different kinds of lenses. I built a little C4D setup that you can actually, you're using bools and using a bunch of Expresso to link it together so you actually can set it, set values that you want the lenses to have. So I could very precisely recreate the lens shapes that I wanted in Cinema 4D. Uh, of course, I made some beautiful renders using these things I was making. This is what Indigo is really good at, are these sort of beautiful glass renders. I took apart my actual lens to figure out what was going on in there, and luckily was mostly able to put it back together in a working state. Uh, I ran across this uh, very sketchy looking Java application uh, called Optical Ray Tracer, which is kind of a great homepage they have here, but uh, it allows you to interactively play with uh, lenses and light rays and sort of how they refract light and how they, so th this, this is kind of what I used to actually more precisely uh, dial in the lens that I actually ended up wanting to create, then create it in Cinema 4D using that rig that I showed you with some more beautiful renders of it, more beautiful renders, focusing light. I took a little detour and made some lens flares because I actually have a physical lens in CG so I can take a bright light, shine it through it, and you actually get a real lens flare. And all sorts of interesting optical imperfections and things like that. Putting it all together, this is again the box you saw earlier from the, the projection, but it's actually putting the camera on the opposite side of that back wall and putting a blurry transparent material which is representing that focusing screen. And this is just me going step by step and trying to figure out how this all works. So you can see there's the transparent material, turn up the roughness, and it becomes a blurry transparent material that then the image that's being focused through that lens ends up projected on that back wall. This is a render I got out of that, proving it actually works. This isn't actually seeing the scene, it's seeing the projection of the scene through the lens on this blurry material. With that, I figured, well, okay, I've got it all working, let's put it in the camera. So here are the pieces, I've got a lens, I've got a mirror, I've got a focusing screen, and then I've got the pentaprism focusing it in towards where the camera's looking. And this was kind of, at the time, my final, uh, my final result. You can see it's exactly what I'd hoped to do. I can take the, the, ca the virtual camera, I can fly it into my physically modeled camera, and I get the view out of the lens, and it actually gets the depth of field and everything like that from the lens itself, not from the Cinema 4D camera. None of that depth of field is rendered through the renderer. It's all rendered through the lens that's projecting this image. Uh, here's an example of that. This is rack focusing by, I'm not changing anything in the Cinema 4D camera, I'm just moving that lens back and forth to change the focal point of where it's uh, focusing on that distant scene. All right, so that's where I was a year ago. So if you want to see that in more detail, because I kind of did that extremely rushed, but I would go through a lot more detail. If you want to go there, go watch that, and uh, you can see that. So what's new since then? So really, I, I've kind of just taken that, this whole thing and just, kind of run with it. Now, that original presentation was largely kind of a snapshot in time. Like, I just kind of happened to have that come up as an interesting opportunity to show the work. And it was kind of, well, this is how far I'm at, so I'll show where I'm at. And of course, I have all these other lingering questions and things I want to try, so I've just continued experimenting with those. So one thing you can see here, this is almost exactly the same render you just saw, except that I've added uh, this focusing assist in the middle. And what this is, is in older SLRs, in older uh, film cameras, before autofocus was a major thing, you'd have these little... Uh, different kinds of uh, uh, focusing assists in the ground glass that would actually distort the image to help you with focusing. So for example, the very middle part, you can see how it's actually horizontally offsetting the image when it's coming in and out of focus. So when a vertical line aligns, it means that it's in focus. And the same thing with that, uh, the micro prism grid around the outside, as that disappears and as you can see straight through it, it means that that object is in focus. Here's another example of that same setup, just panning across an image. And th this was another example of, I thought it would be way more complicated than it actually was to make. You can see there, I literally just modeled it based on what I could figure out it actually was. It's essentially a couple different wedges in the middle that are counter each other, and then a bunch of little prisms around the outside and put a glass material on it. And based on the fact that the renderer is actually doing what light is actually doing in the real world, it works the same way that a focusing assist works on a, in a real camera. I did some tests with anamorphic lenses, and these are, I would say, at the moment, failed experiments. This was about the best I could do, and I couldn't get everything to kind of be in focus. You can see that 
I am horizontally squashing the image, which is what you want out of an anamorphic lens, but I wasn't, as I say, able to get the focus to quite work. I think the focus in the vertical and horizontal axes are at different planes or something like that. But if anyone out there knows more about anamorphic lenses and wants to chat, I'm all up to try and make this better. Uh, but here's an example of the, the gist of what I'm doing is, you can see on the back, those are the normal lenses. And the front there, that, that, those are the, the anamorphic lenses. And the idea is that they're cylindrical lenses rather than spherical lenses. So it's almost like you take the shape of a lens and you extrude it rather than revolving it. Uh, and that, the idea there is you're distorting the, or you're getting a different focal length in one axis than you are the other by having the curvature on one axis, not the other. So again, this is where I got with it. I mean, I, I'm proud to have even gotten that far, but I, I would love to get a cleaner image out of that. Uh, the other thing I've been doing is actually just trying to finish up the actual texturing of this asset. Remember, this all started with trying to make this camera and the whole trying to make the insides of it work was a whole kind of side uh, exercise. So just making it as kind of a beautiful asset with textures and everything. I hadn't really gotten that far with the, the substance painter part, the texturing of it. So this is finishing up the texturing, bringing it back into Cinema 4D and again using Indigo, the render I was using for all those other renders to just see what sort of like beautiful images I could make out of by just shooting this camera as a beautiful object. Uh, here's just a turntable of where I ended up with this, uh, the camera itself. And there it is, kind of broken apart, showing the insides. So the, the gray plane isn't very interesting, so I figured, well, let's make a little scene to stick this guy in. And um, it also just looked kind of empty if it was just the camera on a wood table. So I figured I need to, I need to build some other elements to, to populate the scene and kind of put some things around it. And really the exercise here became, well, how realistic can I make this feel? Can I really fool someone into, into showing, in this, showing them an image of this and thinking that I took a photograph of my desk with these objects on it. And so just building these assets was a lot of fun. It went through the same process. They were all modeled and then put in a substance painter and then brought back in and rendered with Indigo. But uh, this guy, you, you may actually recognize him if you've seen my talks before. Um, this is a little, I guess, a spaceman figurine that is based off of this is a piece I did for South by Southwest a couple years ago, and it was this kind of surreal experience with these little uh, miniature uh, astronauts uh, digging this hole and discovering this old ancient artifact. But anyway, I, I love taking these old assets from previous projects and reusing them in interesting ways. And I've always loved the sort of iconic nature of these, these little astronauts. So I figured why not make him into a little tiny figurine I can put in my scene. And I also, someday I want to actually make a, make a 3D print of this and actually make a real version to stick on my desk. But for the moment, it's only, only virtual. So I'm gonna actually show you how I made that sort of, uh, took a real asset and made it feel more like it's this little plastic figurine. So I'm gonna be using uh, uh, the Volume Builder, which is, I think, one of the biggest additions recently to Cinema 40. It just makes modeling so much more interesting and there's so much more freedom in what you can do. Um, but so here, here's the original asset. So you can see it's even still animated. This was a Mixamo animation. But of course, that's not very helpful when uh, we're trying to make a, a still figurine. So the first thing I do is just, Select it, current state to object. That should strip out any animation from this guy and should just make everything as, uh, yeah. So that, that just removes anything that could cause problems later. Um, and then really, the, it's, it's volume builder is extremely simple. Volume builder, stick your object underneath it. And there you go. So this doesn't look like much, mostly because the scale is tiny. Like this is a little figurine that I actually modeled more or less to scale. So uh, you can see the volume builder right now, the voxel size is 10 centimeters. Let's make that one centimeter instead, and that looks close. I could probably go more detailed than that, but for now, I think that's pretty good. Let me turn off the grid here, just so we don't have that in our way. Yeah, so this looks pretty good, but you can't really tell what it's gonna look like until you actually mesh it. And so the volume builder is two steps. There's the building of the volume itself, which is the voxels, then you need to actually mesh it and create uh, geometry out of it. So that's a separate object that you then stick the builder within. And you can see now I've actually got it as polygons. Now the problem was that the way this was originally modeled actually wasn't very, it obviously wasn't intended for this, and it's a lot of thin objects that don't necessarily have depth to them, and that can cause problems with the volume builder, as you can see here, where it suddenly has holes in it. So the, again, the nice thing that I really like about the volume builder is you don't need to go in there and actually fix those original objects. I can just, say, take a sphere, make it a little more detailed, and then just scale it down. I'm just gonna stick it here up in his head, and you can see if I put this also under the volume builder, now it's actually part of that same hierarchy and it's just merging these all together. So it's an extremely easy way just to fix little problems like this, where I can just align this kind of with his face mask there and almost just create a new one where now suddenly I've filled in all the issues that I was having. You can see even the back of the neck there, there are issues. I'm just gonna make a duplicate of this, drag it out there. 
another duplicate, kind of fill in his neck a little bit. So you can just take these kind of blobby shapes and create all sorts of detail with them. So that's good enough for now. The other thing you'll notice is that it, there's a bit of, these polygons are getting a little sharp here. And the nice thing about the volume builder is you can actually do various smoothing operations on the mesh. So especially because we want this to feel like, like molded plastic or metal or something where you, you tend to get these kind of soft rounded edges, I actually want to accentuate that. So you can do this uh, SDF smooth option here. And you can see by default, it goes kind of extreme and really just turns it into this blob, which we don't really want. But I can change it. I actually really like this mean curvature. and I can't really explain to you what it does exactly. I should probably read the manual and understand it. But all I know is I put it on there and it makes it look better. So I would try it if you're, if you're wanting to smooth out some details on your, your mesh. So that's looking pretty good. Um, another thing I'm missing is I want a base. You know, like those little green army men? Uh, they all they were like standing on these little bases. And that's another thing that just gives it scale and makes it feel like it's a it's tangible object you'd stick on your desk. So again, that's going to be super simple. I'm just going to go to the top view and just do a spline. I'm going to do it uh, as a B spline and just draw the profile of what I want this to look like. And then I can refine it a little bit, but it doesn't need to be perfect. But it has kind of that like kidney bean shape, you know, the, the, I feel like army men always had this sort of like shape to it. All right, so that's good enough for my purposes right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick that in an extrude. Obviously, it's going the wrong direction right now. So rather than that axis, I want it to go up, let's say, two centimeters. Now we just need to drag it down so it's by his feet. And now, again, the nice thing about the volume builder is we can just throw more geometry in there. So we can just stick this extrude under there. And you see how it does that nice smoothing right there. It just like blends it right together like it's all molded in one piece. I'm actually going to give it a little bit of a bevel. Just think that'll look good if it. That's too much. There, that's pretty good. Okay, so yeah, that's looking pretty good. One other detail that molded things like this usually have is because they're they're usually two pieces uh, of a mold that are pushed together and then the, they're injected molded by pushing plastic through them. You usually get these seam lines around the edge, and that's yet another thing that I think just helps sell the scale of something like this as being this little tiny object. So to do that. Again, it's, it's just one more thing I can throw in the volume builder, but um, uh, I'm going to draw a spline using sketch uh, so I can just draw over it. And then I'm going to set my snapping, sorry, snapping, I'm going to enable the snapping, and then I'm going to turn on polygon snap. And I can turn off vertex snap. And now what we can do, if I just draw over my mesh, you'll see it's snapping exactly to the geometry. And I'll just do a couple more. Maybe one there, one down there. And of course, I'd go in and do much more detailed versions of these, but just as a proof of concept. These are all in one spline. And what you could do is you could, ex you could do a sweep. You could sweep a profile along this. But the nice thing about Volume Builder is you actually don't need to. It can take a spline. It can take particles. It can take any of these things and pretend that they are already geometry. So if I stick that in there, you see it's already adding that that little edge, that little seam line going along there. And uh, if I go into the volume builder itself, I can click on the spline. And right now, it says the radius is 1.5. I can make that maybe 1 instead, just to make it subtler. And because this is all still parametric, all of these splines and everything are still completely editable, I can just go in here and say, well, maybe there I want it to be a little subtler and just drag it down. And you can see I can interactively change how these splines, how this volume builder is actually working. All right, so that's, uh, that's, that's the gist of how I made this thing. Now, the next step is UVing. And uh, I, I kind of took some time and actually did a proper UV of this. But the first thing to do, we, we can just use an automated UV in uh, Cinema 4D and it's going to work just fine. But the only thing we need to do is just make it editable first. So I just hit C there and I can delete everything else and just use this mesh that it creates. Um, and so from this, you'll see this is what the UVs are by default out of the volume builder. And that's not very useful. I think it's like a spherical projection or something of this. Uh, but if I go to my UV manager, I can, uh, I, I can change this to be, or I, I can uh, essentially use an automated UVing to make some sort of UVs that at least Substance Painter will, will be able to use, because it needs UVs. It needs some sort of way to map the, 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 the textures you're painting onto the 3D model. So I'm just going to, I think, I don't know. I'm actually not sure what these settings really do, but something like this tends to work pretty well. 
So this is going to take a moment because it is a there's a lot of polygons there for it to figure out. But this will at least generate a passable initial UV map. And so you can see I'm getting some pretty big sections there. The problem is I'm getting all these little tiny individual polygons. And Substance Painter is decent about working with this, but again, it would prefer that you have one uh, sort of nicely UV thing. But for now, this is uh, good enough for for your purposes. And if you wanted to do this, I think this would give you a pretty good result. Um, so that brings us to here. So I just did a quick screen grab. I'm not going to actually do the painting here, but just uh, this is like a sped up version of me playing around with uh, with the model and kind of turning things on and off and painting things. And again, uh, like I said, my, my main goal here is really to go for that sense of scale. So I'm really trying to mimic the idea of paint strokes. I'm trying to get uh, all the wear and all the chips and all the dings. And I'm actually giving thickness to the paint as if it's actually kind of like a enamel paint that's been painted on and you actually, it's, it's raised up over the surface a little bit. Yeah, and just weathering and anything that a, a, a a person who's actually had this little thing in their hand, they were trying to use a paintbrush to paint it, what would they actually do? Were they trying to do this? And then here's the final, final result, again, rendered in Indigo, the renderer that I was using for everything else. So another thing that I, I really found important in getting the realism of that scene was the idea of dust. Now, you might not think about it in sort of a big room, but once you're looking at something macro, something small, it's amazing how dusty the world that we're in actually is. This was a photo I took of my Wacom tablet like after, it was probably the morning when I'd come in after night, after the, after the night, and this is like how much this collects overnight on the black surface when you take a photo of it. And so trying to get all these little fibers and all this little particulate just uh, into that scene was an interesting challenge that I wanted to, to figure out. So here's the scene again, and this was me just sort of very early on just trying to figure out, okay, how do I scatter things over a scene? And this was using X particles and a cube just because a cube is easy to make and I wasn't sure if it would even work yet. So just throwing a cube in there, scattering it over the scene. This is actually having modeled some, some little tiny fibers. This is turning the scale up way too much. And I kind of love when you get these weird, gross looking renders with worms and things. Of course, if I'm going to go this far, I might as well go all the way. And so I did a render where I put like a skin shader on it and made it look like these gross little <laughs> worms wriggling over my camera. Uh, but you can see here, here's, here's a more final render where it's, it's actually very difficult to see, but if it wasn't there, you wouldn't. What it does, it just helps break up the silhouette and it just adds a little bit of texture that you couldn't otherwise get through, uh, through actual texturing. It actually just gives dimension and volume to, to these little these particulates. So you can see a close up there where you're getting these little fibers kind of sticking off of it and there on the back of that lens. So I'm going to show you real quick with this same uh, character how I, uh, how I set this up. So this is set up using Redshift. Again, I'm going to turn on the Redshift render view just so we can make sure that it's working. Something like Redshift, it'll take a little while initially to process the textures and get the scene uh, cached. But once it is, it's extremely fast to iterate. So there's usually a little bit of a lag here while it's processing. There we go. So yeah, you can see here, this is the same figurine we had before. There we go. So I'm just going to dock this just so we can get an interactive view of what we're doing. Zoom in a little bit. All right. So as I said, the, the goal here is to add dust to this. This is like a little tiny figurine. I want it to feel like there's kind of just little bits of particular that I've kind of collected over it. And so the, the first thing I want to do is actually model some little dust. And as you saw from that photo, you might think that they're just little spheres or something. But they're actually, they, they tend to be these little uh, fibers. They're these little almost like tubes almost, like these little hairs. So the way I'm going to model that is uh, actually extremely simple. Again, I'm going to use the sketch here and let's go to our top view and I'm just going to draw some shapes and you can see it's actually closing the splines that doesn't matter actually all it really needs to do is just sort of create some different little random squiggly things so now they've created all these splines I'm going to select all of them I'm going to uncheck close spline so now they're all open-ended and I'm going to change them from a bezier to a b spline just because that'll smooth it out a little bit okay so these are what I'm going to use for the dust. The next step, I'm just going to, what I want to do is I want to uh, merge all of them. So I'm going to just connect objects and delete. So they're all in one spline, which makes this op next operation a little easier, which is I want to put a sweep over them. And then I'm going to use an end side, which I like end sides more than spheres, just because, especially for low poly things like this that don't need a lot of detail, you get more control over how many sides versus having to change the angle of the, the, the smoothing on other things. But we don't see much because it's actually huge, and this is a really tiny scene. So I think we maybe want, you know, like point one is getting closer, 
0.05. We're not even smaller than that. But you can also see that our, our uh, the plane that our end side is actually wrong. There we go. So now I can go back to my normal view, and you can see here. Those are way too fat still, so let's just go back into our inside and maybe make it even smaller. That looks pretty good. So I just made some little squiggly things that hopefully we never actually see close up. The idea is just to get a little bit of a profile of this stuff once we actually clone them all over our surface. Speaking of clones, we could probably use a cloner to do this, but I'm using X particles because I think there's a little more control over it in there, and that's kind of how I like to do it. But you could probably just use a cloner if you don't have X particles to do this next step. Uh, so I'm going to make my sweep editable, and then if you have a bunch of geometry like this that's all in one object and you want to separate them back out into separate objects, the fastest way to do that is mesh conversion polygon groups to objects. And what it will do is it will then make each of those individual connected groups of polygons their own object. So I'm going to take all these sweeps. I don't, I don't need any of these selection tags or anything, so I'm going to delete all those. And then a couple last things. Uh, the offset point on all this geometry is actually at the zero point of the scene still, so I need to uh, Mesh, axis, axis center. If you just hit execute by default, what it will do is it will center the axis points on the geometry. So each piece of the geometry now has an axis on the middle of it. And then again, a very minor detail, but I actually want to move the axis points down a little bit so that when I put them on the surface, they're not intersecting the surface. They're actually sitting on top of the surface. OK. And then the last thing I'm going to do is just zero these all out so that they are at the zero point of the scene, just because that will simplify things later. OK. So now I've got a bunch of. Somewhere in there, I've got a bunch of little particles that I'm going to put all over my scene. So as I said, I'm going to use X particles. So if I just create an X particle system, uh, I'm going to, in the emitter, the object. So right now it's a rectangle. What I want to do is I want to use another object as the object that's emitting from. So if I select object, drag in this geo null here has all my geometry in it. So drag that into object. And then a few things here I want to emit from polygon area rather than polygon center, so I can have as many polygons as I want. And then I want to stick the particles to the source objects. So they should never move. They should literally be spawned on the geometry and stay there. Uh, and then direction, I want normals fine. Normals should be fine for the direction. And then emission, uh, by default it's rate, which means it will consistently, uh, over time, continue to emit. But I actually just want to emit one group of particles all at the same time. So what I'm going to do is shot, which means that on frame one, it will emit 1,000 particles, and that's it, just on that one frame. So the next thing I want to do is purely for display purposes, I'm just going to change it from dots to squares. And if I go forward one frame, you see we've covered our guy with green particles. Unfortunately, I also wanted to cover the ground. And this is, that's debatable whether you'd actually want to do that. But the, the issue here is that in by default, because I put a null in there, it's going to select the first object, I think, or we're just going to choose one of those two objects to actually put the particles on. So I'm actually going to switch it to connect objects, which means that it treats it as one solid, the whole thing, everything in that null is one object. OK. So now we've just done sort of a scattering of these uh, particles, but they don't yet have the geometry. Of course, that's the whole point, is we want all those little squiggly uh, pieces of geometry uh, all over our, our guy here. So in X particles, you do that using a generator. So if I go to generator objects, X particles generator, and then if I stick all of these sweeps under that generator, what it's going to do is it's going to randomly choose between all of this geometry and stick each one of the one of those pieces of geometry on each one of those particles as it iterates through it. Uh, and I can actually force that by telling it to be random, not sequential, although it's essentially a random group of particles, so it shouldn't shouldn't matter. If I respawn them, OK. so. It worked, but they're green and they're enormous. So we've got a couple problems there. Uh, one of these we can solve by, uh, by, right now it's using the particle radius to scale it. And we can actually set that to the particle scale, which is closer to what we want. And that's kind of a minor difference. But you see how that gets us most of the way there. And then once we go back to our emitter, we can then go into emission scale and change the particle scale here. So let's say we want that to be a little bit smaller. So let's go to 0.8. And then we can add a variation of maybe 0.1 or something, so they're not all the same size as each other. OK, so that's pretty good. The main problem now is that they're all facing the same direction. You can see that the same one is always facing that direction. So there's no randomness to the orientation of, of these particles. So that is a little more difficult to do in X particles than I would like, but it's here. So if you go to extended 
data, you can enable rotation on the particles. So that's one pass to mission. And then we can set it to be tangential, which means that it will use the tangent of the geometry or the direction that the particles emitted from, which is the because we set the, the normal, that's the direction of the normal of the geometry. So in theory, if I did that correctly, they should now be aligning to the normal, which means they're sticking straight up in the air, which we don't want. The easy way to fix that, there, there are a couple of different ways, but the easy way is actually to just take your all of your geometry, and I think it's rotating it. I'm just rotating the axis 90 degrees this way, which I think fixes the orientation of that. And that's kind of a dumb cheat, but it'll work. I regenerate it. There we go. So that's pretty good. I think I want maybe them smaller and more of them. So in emitter, I'm going to go into emission and let's make it maybe 1500. And then for my scale, I'm going to do 0.5. Regenerate them. All right, that's pretty good. So if we go back here to our redshift we're under, you can see, OK, we've got a bunch of, well, it looks kind of like dust, more maybe worms, but Let's say that's dust. The problem is that they're green. So let's make let's make a material. And so a bunch of renders have uh, these handy uh, features for them, specifically for instances like this, where you want something to be able to be backlit. Now, if you think of dust, it's so thin and often like slightly transparent. So if it's backlit by a light, it will actually illuminate itself. It'll actually glow almost. And that's from the light on the far side shining through it. And technically, that's subsurface scattering, but that's an extremely computationally intensive way to render something so small and so insignificant. So um, this backlighting translucency is actually what we want to use. So to start, I'm actually just going to apply the material without it, just so you can see. So if I apply it to the generator itself, you should see now. I zoom in. They just look like thick clay, non-translucent objects stuck to them. So uh, if we go into the material here, get this set up in a good way. It's the redshift material. Uh, so this right here is the feature that we want, which is backlighting and translucency. And as I say, most renders have some form of this. But the trick is, so if I just crank it up to 100, you see it's kind of working. You get a little difference there. But if I change the color of it, and this is maybe going to be too extreme, but if I go to white, you'll see how suddenly they're actually illuminated. They're glowing. And once you get further away and start just looking at this as this scene with these little illuminated bits of detritus and debris over it, it actually gets really nice when you get these little pings of highlights of the dust, and especially if there's camera movement or light moving or anything like that. You get this really beautiful, uh, beautiful effect. We, we, can have, uh, we, we can play with various settings here and make it look better, but that's the gist of it. And really, I think going this extra mile and adding these little details like this really brings a scene to life. So here again, this was the in my example sort of. So I, I think I went much smaller with it. So I really went tiny and added a lot more. And obviously that kills render time, but it just, as I say, I think it just makes it way more beautiful. All right. So that was kind of a tangent on sort of making that scene. But back to cameras. Obviously, based on that earlier stuff I did, the next logical step is well, let's photograph my camera with my camera. So it's essentially the exact same setup you saw before. It's just clicking through my camera to see my camera. Uh, And just to, to give you a sense of how impractical this is actually to do, the, the frames out here where I'm viewing the outside, these are probably about five minutes of frame to get a somewhat noisy result. Once you're actually looking through the viewfinder at that camera, those are probably hour and a half, if not more, per frame to render. So this isn't exactly a production-ready technique to make images. It's more just <laughs> it's more a personal learning exploration than anything. Uh, here's the same, again, uh, kind of a mirror of what I showed earlier, but this time, uh, uh, rendering my own camera using, uh, again, the, the, the focus assist, where you can see the splitting of the images. Uh, and you just get a very interesting painterly quality to it, that you get a little bit of light leaking in that actually lifts the blacks a bit. You just you get all these little imperfections and things that even though it is a digital creation, it, it has a more painterly real feel than, than something rendered straight out of a, a, a CG camera. So here's the setup. So it's, it's what you would have expected. It's the, the Cinema 4D camera looking through the viewfinder to see the other camera. But why stop there when I can add another camera to view through my camera to view my camera? 
Uh, so this is a render of that. This was, again, uh, exponential increase in render time. This is probably about three and a half hours to get a single frame that's pretty noisy. But again, it's like you, you're kind of just accentuating the, the imperfections. You're getting even more chromatic or uh, vignetting around the edge. The whole thing's just a little bit softer. You're getting kind of that really lifted blacks from contamination of light coming in. But why stop there when I can add even yet another camera? And this is the best I could get out of that setup. So this was probably four and a half or five hours worth of rendering to get this image. And you can see even like, I don't know what those like weird dots are on the side of the screen, but like that's just light bouncing around inside all of this craziness that I've built just results in that stuff. But for a moment, I just want to marvel at the, the, the way Ray Tracer works is it shoots rays out of the camera itself and that ray needs to find light. If it doesn't find light, it, it's black. So in order for to get any image on that screen, that ray of light that came out of the camera needed to go through the viewfinder lens, which is just a piece of glass, bounces three times on through the, the, the mirrors to get through the penaprism, goes through a piece of ground glass, bounces off a mirror, goes through five more lenses, and then does that three more times before even finding the scene that is then lit by a, a, a light source that's off camera, so it's then a bounce to get there. And that's only a one bounce, not even multiple bounces to get GI or any sort. So just the, the amount of travel that a single pixel worth of information or a single, single photon to get from the light to the camera, I think is kind of mind blowing what we're actually even able to do, even if that did take four or five hours to render that kind of terrible frame. So this is what people seem to want to know is like, what, what's this actually good for? And the, the answer that I've given before is not much. It's really, it's really best for me to, to kind of explore in personal satisfaction more than anything. But I, I've kind of come across the, the notion that it, it is a decent to teaching tool, that it actually does help give an intuitive understanding of what's going on with a camera. And in CG, you, you have these, these virtual cameras that you have these values that mean kind of arbitrary things that you slide things around and change them. And it, it's easy to get lost in what that actually means or what that's actually doing or what that would be doing in the real world to actually change the photograph you're taking. So like in, just in the default Cinema 4D camera, here are all these options. It's like, what do any of these actually mean? I mean, you get sort of get used to it when you start messing with them and sliding them around and different renderers have different options. So it's, it's kind of all over the place when you're figuring that stuff out. But just to give one example, the sensor size. So this is literally the, 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 the size of the piece of film or the sensor that is behind the lens that is recording the data from the image that's coming through the lens. So this is interesting because recently there's been like a huge uptick in like people wanting to shoot in IMAX and like these large format cameras that have huge sensors. And there's almost become this sort of cult around them of, of this kind of mystical ability that they have of creating images that you can't get anywhere else. And there, there is some truth to that. But when you actually break down what it is that changing the sensor size actually does inside the camera, you kind of realize that it's not magical. It's not anything crazy. It's like, it's, it's very simple. And if we go back to, this is again, the very early test that was the pinhole camera. And if you imagine that that back wall, that is our sensor, like there's light being focused from the outside through this aperture and being projected onto the back wall there. So imagine if we just change the size of the sensor, that's literally all a sensor size is doing is just making that area bigger or smaller. And so it, it, it's, it's literally the same thing as changing the, the well, not literally, it's, it's essentially the same thing as, as changing the, the focal length. You're just cropping in on a different portion of the image. And that does have impacts on the lenses you would choose. So for example, if you were using a 50 millimeter lens, the equivalent, once you go with a bigger sensor size might be, it looks like you're shooting through a 35 millimeter lens. It changes the, the look of the image in that way. And that also changes the aperture. The, the aperture is a function of the focal length. And there, there are all these in, intricate things that go into it. But when you actually break it down into what's literally happening in the camera, it suddenly actually becomes intuitively much more easy to understand what is really happening. Uh, so another example is shutter speed. And um, this is kind of an interesting one because there, you can see there, there are two ways of doing shutter speed. There's the fraction of a second, and that's pretty obvious. It's like you're used to thinking in fractions of a second or a whole second or half second, wh whatever that fraction is, like that's easy to understand. Okay, that's the amount of time that you're exposing the image for. That makes sense. But right below it, there's a shutter angle, and that, that's, that's usually used for movie cameras, for film cameras. And that's a much more abstract thing to try to understand. So I'm gonna quickly show you uh, a little demo that I put up that again, I think just uh, shows how something like this can be used to to understand these things better. This is gonna be very similar to that penaprism example I was showing earlier. I was trying to exploring how the light travels through the camera, except this time it's a continuous stream of light that's entering the camera. And you can see for a brief moment there, the, the mirror that is bouncing the light up to the viewfinder flips up. 
And what that's doing is it's exposing the film or the sensor for amount as long as that mirror is being flipped up. So I can change that. I go into my dope sheet, I can just drag these keyframes around to see what it what happens if so you can see if it's exposed for longer, it's literally more light is allowed to come in over longer, which of course, as you would expect, means that you're getting more motion blur because there's more time for the outside to be smeared across that uh, the sensor for that one frame. So I think this is pretty intuitive. This most people kind of understand. You're, you're dealing in fractions of a second, but the harder thing to understand is shutter degrees. So this is a little more complicated to understand maybe what you're looking at, but imagine this is the lens of a movie camera and this is the shutter and this is the film being exposed. So if I hit play here, I think it'll make a little more sense. So the image is coming in from the right, passing the shutter and the shutter is a mirror. So it either reflects the light upwards to the viewfinder or lets it through to the film. And every time it rotates, the film is advanced by one frame. So 180 degrees literally means that is the amount of degrees that this shutter is open. So you can see right now, if I, let's lock this so I can unselect it. We've got a slice. So right now it's set to 180 degrees. So that means that the image is being exposed for literally half the time. So half the time it's exposed, half the time it's covered, half the time it's exposed. So it's a 360 degree circle and 180 degrees is open. If I change this to 90 degrees, you can see now only a quarter of it is open. So you get a much you get much less exposure because less light's being let in. You also get less motion blur because there's a shorter uh, amount of time that's being exposed on the outside. And again, I think visualizing this stuff as a physical thing or a real thing that's actually moving and advancing the film and all of that, I think you suddenly get a much more intuitive understanding when you're adjusting these values what they mean. So to the opposite extreme, if you set this to, this even work, like 360, like in theory you can set shutter angles to 360 and that means that literally the entire time light is going into this camera. And that's physically impossible for a film camera. Digital cameras can do that, but it also, you start to get the sense that, well, maybe that's not the best thing to choose because that's kind of physically problematic. And that's also the reason that often you, you if you're viewing certain films and it sort of looks off or the sort of soap opera effect is often caused by this kind of extreme motion blur where it's, the, they, they set the shutter angle to something much higher than 180 degrees. So, and then, yeah, let's, let's go back to like, so 45 degrees and extremely narrow. And you can see how much less Actually getting some, you see how many fewer particles are actually reaching that film. And this was like in Saving Private Ryan for the beach landing scene, they used 140, or sorry, a 45 degree angle because it gave us this very staccato feel. It felt like sort of newsreel-like where it was extreme. There was almost no motion blur at all. It's like you saw a very sh sharp crisp motion in everything that happened. So there are creative reasons that you can choose these settings. And I think it's important to know why they are what they are and when to choose them. So I want to finish just with a couple of, these are my favorite renders that I've created with this entire process. This is sort of one side figured out the, the way the, the, the camera would actually work with all of the components in there and just putting essentially a fog around it and shining light through the lens and just seeing what the light actually does when you're looking at it through a volumetric light and just seeing it being focused on that focusing screen and then being scattered upwards to where you would actually view it. And that's what I've got. Thank you so much. Uh, if you want to see more, go to jeremycox.com. Jeremy is my Twitter if you want to say hi. That's where I'm usually hanging out. But yeah, thank you all so much.